Welcome everybody, we've got a good one for you right now. Absorption and reflection of electromagnetic radiation. What does that mean and why does it matter? Well, you can see in this picture that the sun is showering us with electromagnetic photons all the time. Some things like snow reflect tons of those photons, most of them. Other things like dark asphalt absorb most of them and don't reflect very many back into the sky. So that difference in reflective behavior between different materials is the basis for remote sensing. It's what allows us to discriminate between different materials in a picture that a satellite has taken of the Earth's surface. So in this video, we're going to look at these basic concepts that underlie this and build your understanding uh, for, for down the road. So we're going to talk about three things. What are absorption and reflection? How do those combine to give us a reflectance spectra or a specific kind of reflectance signature for each material? And then what are the types of absorption that can happen? Electron transition, molecular vibration, and molecular rotation. And how are those different and how do they affect different processes differently? Okay, so reflection is what happens when a photon hits an object and bounces back, um, just like light in the mirror. There's no change in wavelength and there's no energy transferred. Absorption is the opposite. The photon strikes a material, the energy of that photon is transmitted into the material, and the photon is destroyed. It's so important to understand that because as things absorb photons, they actually absorb energy. And in some cases, they get hotter. Great example is black asphalt on the road. It absorbs photons all day. They transfer their energy as they're destroyed, and it heats up the, the black uh, road surface. So we can quantify these mathematically as the reflectivity of a material that is the total energy reflected divided by the total incident energy or the energy that hit the surface, right? It's just a fraction, it's less than one, and it is basically the fraction of energy that's reflected. Absorptivity is the opposite. It's one minus reflectivity. It's basically the, the fraction of energy that was absorbed, right? And these are, these are important. And these change by material and by wavelength. So, in this picture of vegetation, snow, and sky, you can see that different materials are absorbing and reflecting different wavelengths differently. The snow reflects strongly in all the visible wavelengths. The vegetation reflects strongly in the green, and shadows are actually dark. Because no light is hitting them, they have nothing to reflect, so they appear as dark shadows. Okay, but but fundamentally, each material is reflecting or absorbing different wavelengths of light, which gives it a different color. And we can quantify that for different materials using this idea of the reflectance spectra. I like to think of this as a fingerprint or a barcode for each type of material. So here's a, on the bottom is wavelength, okay? And on the x the y-axis is reflectance, okay? So we got a couple different materials here. Let's look first at snow. Snow is extremely reflective at short wavelengths down in the visible, okay? That's why it's so bright to our eye. But actually, as you go towards longer wavelengths, snow actually becomes less reflective. It tends to be absorbing uh, wave, those longer wavelengths in the near infrared. And we'll talk about why that is in a second. Okay, in contrast, vegetation um, has a bit different reflectance spectra. It is overall much less reflective than snow. At, a, at best, it reflects 10% of the photons. Uh, sorry, at best, it ref we're looking at the green line here. So at best, it reflects, uh, you know, 5 or 10%. And notice in particular that it's not flat here, right? It, um, it tends to absorb the visible wavelengths very, very well, right? But it actually tends to reflect 
the near infrared. Uh, and of course, that's the basis for life on Earth, right? The fact that vegetation is absorbing the visible wavelengths and turning it into energy for us to eat is the reason that we're here and the reason we're driving cars around. But the main point is that all different materials have these different reflectance spectra and we can exploit them to identify different materials from each other. Okay, so what is causing all the bumps and peaks on that reflectance spectra? Why isn't it just flat? It's because all those, those peaks are absorption peaks or the lack of absorption. Um, they, are, they are a property of the material saying whether or not that material absorbs photons at that specific wavelength. And they are the combined effect of three types of processes. The first type is electron transitions, which mostly uh, affect high energy uh, photons greater than 40 eV. And we've talked about those in a previous video. The photon comes in and the energy is transferred and causes uh, an electron to jump up in energy level. So the electron jumps in energy level and the photon is destroyed. Another type is vibrational resonance, okay? This is more of a middle energy, 3 to 40 eV. Um, the photon has the same frequency as the natural vibration frequency of a molecular bond. So almost like hitting a pitchfork, that photon comes in, causes a molecule to vibrate, and uh, the photon is destroyed, transfers its energy into the molecule. And then we have rotational resonance. This is the lowest energy. So these are long wavelength, low energy photons. That photon resonates with the rotational frequency of a gas molecule and uh, transfers its energy into rotation of the molecule. The word resonant here uh, means that the energy required of the photon for the photon to actually be absorbed and destroyed has to exactly match the, the kind of desired energy of the molecule or the electron. Um, so that's called a resonance. So if they don't match, then um, the photon will likely be reflected instead of absorbed and destroyed. So let's look a little more closely at each of these. I kind of explained them all, but we'll go through them again. So electronic transitions. Um, one thing about that is although we often explain it in terms of an electron transition, you know, jumping up in energy level in a single atom, in fact, in nature, uh, it's very rare, it's never, that atoms exist on their own. Almost always they exist as molecules or as crystal structures in rock or crystal structure or, you know, complex organic molecules in vegetation. So in fact, usually electron transitions are happening within a mo molecular electron field. Um, and the truth, the fact is it takes a lot less energy to, uh, to drive an electron transition in a crystal field or a molecule field than it does in, a, in an ion, a single atom. So usually we're gonna think about these um, electron transitions as being very complex things that we may not even understand exactly what's happening, um, but electrons are jumping around within crystals or, or molecular structures. A uh, good quick example of this is absorption peaks in iron-bearing minerals. Iron uh, is an element with a lot of electrons. It has filled out to a lot of different valence levels, and so um, it has a number of absorption peaks that are due to electron transitions. So here's like the mineral olivine, which is a, can be an iron-rich silicate and has some um, absorption peaks here due to electron transitions. Okay, so the next example is vibrational absorption, okay? So remember, this is when a photon transfers its energy into a molecule and causes it to actually vibrate so all molecules actually have lots of different ways to vibrate. Um, the more atoms in the molecule, the more ways they can vibrate. And this is, this is a rule of thumb is three times the number of atoms minus six gives you the number of vibrational modes. You, that will not be on the exam. You don't, don't need to know that, but um, 
Uh, and uh, each of those vibrational modes corresponds to some frequency defined by the rate at which the atoms move back and forth. And as I said before, if the photon matches that frequency, it'll resonate and trigger the vibration. So here's a water molecule. It can stretch. Here, both the H's are going in and out at the same time in a symmetric stretch. Here, you can have an asymmetric stretch where one, one hydrogen comes in and another hydrogen goes out, or a bend where the two hydrogen bonds kind of flex away from each other and back towards each other. So those are examples of how the water molecule can vibrate. Now, it gets even more complicated. You can actually have what are called overtones. Those are actually linear combinations of the fundamental vibrational frequencies. So actually, when we look at the important absorption bands in water, a lot of them are actually combinations of these fundamental uh, V1, V2, and V3, these stretches and bends. And here's some of those, those combinations and the wavelength at which they tend to uh, absorb. And here that is visually, okay? This is an absorption plot of liquid water. Here's wavelength, here's absorption. Okay, no, this is not reflection, so it's the opposite. Um, and we see these peaks here, one near 800 nanometers, one near 1,000, one near 1,200. So each of those is some combination of, of the vibrational modes um, actually driving absorption of photons out in the uh, infrared. Okay, so let's step back for a second. So we've talked about electron transitions and vibrational uh, absorption. How do those two things combine to govern the reflectance spectra of a material? Well, let's look at this reflectance spectra of a leaf, okay? This is a healthy leaf, and what we see is that down here in the visible, we have two absorption troughs here that are both driven by electron transitions within the chlorophyll molecule. Okay, and then out here in the further infrared, we have some absorption troughs that are driven by uh, the water molecule. And actually some of these are the ones that we just saw on the previous slide. Okay, so at the farther, the longer wavelengths, it's a vibration of the water molecule that's absorbing photons. The shorter wavelengths, it's uh, electron transitions in the chlorophyll. So guess what? As leaves die, their reflective properties change. Their reflectance spectra changes as the leaf dies. And the reason is because the chlorophyll molecule breaks down. And as it, it, it stops being produced, and as the remainder breaks down, it stops absorbing red light. As that happens, instead of being absorbed, that red light is reflected back to your eye, and you get foliage suddenly these trees are turning red because they uh, don't have any more chlorophyll. So just to hit that home, here's the reflectance spectra of chlorophyll. This is, and so notice we've got these, sorry, this is the absorption spectrum. Notice we have these absorption peaks here in the red. So when chlorophyll breaks down, these go away. Um, that leaf starts reflecting red instead of absorbing it. And uh, everyone gets on a tour bus to Vermont and we're glad to have you. Um, and here's just another example that I'm beating a dead horse here, but um, this is a cool data set which shows the reflectance spectra of a healthy leaf, 515 milligrams per meter squared of chlorophyll. That's this low line. Then a yellow leaf that's almost dead, uh, almost no chlorophyll, and it is now reflecting in the red instead of absorbing. So the reflectance spectra of the leaf changes as that chlorophyll goes away. So I couldn't talk about reflectance of a leaf without talking about this thing called the NDVI. Um, it's called the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. And this is its mathematical formulation. But um, one way to think of it is really as a ratio of the difference between, or metric of the difference between absorption in the visible, or I guess we'll say reflectance in the visible, relative to reflectance in the near infrared. 
And this is really important for measuring vegetation health, right? Because as plants start to die or be less healthy, they start to reflect more in the visible, I should be pointing down here, um, and they'll start to reflect less in the infrared as they, uh, as they get dried out, they have less water and they have less chlorophyll, and so that ratio starts to change. So here's an index that actually exploits the changes in these absorption properties as leaves, um, as leaves start to die. And here's just an example. NDVI is so widely used in so many different fields um, to measure vegetation health, crop health, all kinds of things. Okay, so we're getting towards the end here. So rem remember, our third type of absorption is rotational, okay? Uh, so here's an example, I believe, of a water molecule, though I'm not actually sure. Uh, no, it's, it's not a water molecule. Uh, rotating. Okay, and notice it can rotate on two different axes. It can rotate on a kind of horizontal axis or on a vertical axis. Um, and uh, if a photon of the right energy resonates with one of those rotations, it will absorb the photon. So that's the process. This is mostly important for uh, molecules in the atmosphere because in order to rotate, the molecule really has to be floating. It can't be attached to other molecules, right? So rotation doesn't really happen in a, in a rock, like in a piece of quartz. The, the crystal structure is too tight. Um, it happens more to gases in the atmosphere. And so it turns out that rotational and vibrational absorption bands are hugely important in the atmosphere, and they're hugely important in limiting the utility of remote sensing. Here's the reason. If you look at this black line right here, it is the solar radiation received at the top of the atmosphere. Basically looks like the black body curve, right, that we looked at in a previous video. In white, we see the solar radiation at sea level. What do we have? We have these huge troughs, right? These are places where certain wavelengths of light have been absorbed by vibration or rotation of molecules. So this one is caused by eight, by water. This one's caused by water and CO2. So it's mostly water and CO2 and a little bit of oxygen that are conspiring to absorb some of that light in the atmosphere. In the extreme case, in fact, they absorb all of it, okay? So here's a case near uh, 1.4 microns where none of the sun's radiation at 1.4 microns actually makes it to the surface. It's entirely absorbed in the atmosphere. So uh, this gives rise to the idea of an atmospheric window, okay? Atmospheric windows are ranges of wavelengths, for example, like this interval in here, or this interval in here, where the atmosphere is not absorbing very much of the sun's radiation. The atmosphere is allowing that radiation to pass through it, much like a window. Um, okay, and, and so when, when we think about how to design uh, missions for remote sensing or wavelengths that we want to collect satellite imagery in, we almost always avoid these, these troughs and we always, almost always collect photos in the atmospheric window. So it's hugely important. And just to summarize all of these absorp absorption reactions, here they are. Wavelength, energy, and just to remind you, electronic transitions are the higher energy, lower wavelength. Vibrational bands are in the middle, and rotational absorption takes place at the longer wavelengths. So this is a good summary of what we just talked about. And in summary, photons can be absorbed or reflected when they strike a surface. Three types of processes cause absorption, electron transitions, molecular vibrations, and molecular rotations. Absorption peaks determine the reflectance spectra of a material, which might include all three types of these absorption processes. Ratio indexes like NDVI 
are designed to quantify changes in the reflectance spectra. And finally, vibration and rotation of molecules in the atmosphere absorb certain wavelengths and leaves other atmospheric windows, like we just saw. We made it, everybody. A lot of useful information in that one. Hope you got it. Watch it again if not. And don't forget to vote. Bye.